morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is such a blessing to meet you all again, despite the circumstances. Before I start this lecture, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Noel Martin Bautista, Associate Professor from the Department of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology, and Nutrition of the University of Santo Tomas. It is my distinct pride and joy to deliver to you my lecture on a highly complex but fun, highly multifaceted but eye-opening, and challenging but surmountable topic in biochemistry, bioenergetics, and biological oxidation. This topic is intimidating or daunting to say the least, but let's try to take it step by step. Hopefully, the concepts will be appreciated and thus open up explanation in life. And our existence and what makes us stick will make more sense. In the previous lectures, you have learned about the first three biomolecules involved in metabolism. These are the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. You have also studied what makes reactions happen, and these are through the courtesy of your friendly neighborhood enzymes and their sidekicks, the coenzymes. With all the substrates, the fuel, the catalysts, and coenzymes present, can reactions now happen? No. One element is missing, and that is energy. Some reactions require energy to happen, and some produce energy when they happen. And this is what we are going to cover in the next two hours or so. Energy changes or transductions within biological systems that make reactions, movement, work, building up or breaking down of complex molecules possible. Biological energy transductions obey the same physical laws that govern all other natural processes. It is therefore essential for us to understand these laws and how they apply to the flow of energy in the biosphere. In this lecture, we will first review the laws of thermodynamics and the quantitative relationships among free energy, enthalpy, and entropy. We will then describe the special role of the adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and other high energy compounds in biological energy exchanges. Next is we will discuss the process and importance of oxidation reduction reactions in living cells, the energetics of electron transfer reactions, especially within the powerhouse of the cell or the mitochondria. We will also analyze the different types of phosphorylation and contrast one from the other, that of substrate level and oxidative types of phosphorylation. And of course, we will also examine one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century, that of the chemiosmotic coupling which is involved in oxidative phosphorylation. We will also take a closer look into the electron transport chain, the different sites and complexes therein, and the concept of the PO ratio. Lastly, we will learn about the different agents that interrupt the electron transport chain and why such are considered dangerous poisons. Such a lot to cover in our limited time, so without further ado, let's start. Bioenergetics is the quantitative study of the energy transductions that occur in living cells and of the nature and function of the chemical processes underlying these transductions. Or simply stated, bioenergetics is the study of the energy changes that accompany chemical reactions. Metabolism, which is the sum total of all the biochemical processes within the body, consists of different energy utilizing and energy liberating reactions. In metabolism, metabolic fuel is utilized through biological oxidations, and the energy produced from such reactions may be utilized to drive the energy requiring reactions. The relationship between these two types of reactions is studied in bioenergetics, also called biochemical thermodynamics. It is thus important to review the principles of thermodynamics to appreciate how energy producing and energy utilizing metabolic reactions can take place within the same cell and how an organism is able to accomplish various work functions. Cells and organisms must perform work to stay alive, to grow, and to reproduce. The ability to harness energy and to channel it into biological work is a fundamental property of all living organisms. It must have been acquired very early in cellular evolution. Modern organisms carry out a remarkable variety of energy transductions, conversions of one form of energy to another. They use the chemical energy in fuels to bring about the synthesis of complex 
highly ordered macromolecules from simple precursors. They also convert the chemical energy of fuels into concentration gradients and electrical gradients into motion and heat. This exchange of energy is mediated by the universal energy currency, the adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Thus, bioenergetics is involved in the usage of energy in anabolic and catabolic processes. From this illustration, we can simply say that without energy, all metabolic processes stopped and life ends. We are all composed of cells. In the bioenergetics world, it is the cells that are the consummate transducers of energy, capable of interconverting chemical, electromagnetic, mechanical, and osmotic energy with great efficiency. Thus, a lot of energy interconversion occur in living organisms. Let's go through this step by step. First, organisms will have to take in potential energy from the environment. These are the nutrients taken from the surroundings in the form of food or for photosynthetic plants, sunlight. Subsequently, these organisms convert some of this energy derived from the environment into useful forms of energy for work like biochemical synthesis, locomotion and other mechanical work, osmotic and electrical gradients, and genetic information transfer. However, not all energy will be converted to work. Some will be returned to the surroundings in the form of heat. Concomitantly, during the process, these organisms will release back to the environment end product molecules like water, carbon dioxide, urea, substances all that are less well organized than the starting fuel, thereby increasing the disorderliness of the universe. And lastly, one effect of all these transformations is increased order or direct decreased randomness within the organism in the form of complex macromolecules and an organized system of structure and function. This is putting bioenergetics in its proper context, how we, living, growing, and breathing organisms, transduce energy in order to live. We can't really understand bioenergetics without delving in the natural laws that govern biological reactions and systems as well. Let us now jump into some serious stuff. The laws of thermodynamics give us the guidelines for the interconversion of energy from one form to the other. Let us first define what thermodynamics is. Thermodynamics is a branch of physics that deals with heat, work, and temperature, and the relation to energy, radiation, and physical properties of matter. The behavior of these quantities is governed by the four laws of thermodynamics, which convey a quantitative description using measurable macroscopic physical quantities but may be explained in terms of microscopic constituents by statistical mechanics. Additionally, thermodynamics applies to a wide variety of topics in science and engineering, especially physical chemistry, chemical engineering, and mechanical engineering, but also in other complex fields such as meteorology. I think no one, including me, understood what I just said. Anyway, let us try to simplify this concept and just jump straight into its biochemical applications. We will just discuss the first two laws of thermodynamics. There are four laws, but it is only the first two laws that mostly pertain to biological systems. The first of these laws is the principle of the conservation of energy. This law states that for any physical or chemical change, the total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. In the same vein, energy may change form or it may be transported from one region to another, but it cannot be created nor destroyed. In connection with the first law, the law of energy conservation, one thermodynamic quantity becomes relevant. In the realm of physics, enthalpy, symbolized by the capital letter H, of a thermodynamic system is defined as the sum of its internal energy and the work required to achieve its pressure and volume. Biochemically, however, enthalpy or age can be simply referred to as the heat content of the reacting system. It reflects the number and kinds of chemical bonds in the reactants and products. The total enthalpy of a system cannot be measured directly because the internal energy contains components that are unknown 
not easily accessible, or are not of interest in thermodynamics. In practice, a change in the enthalpy or delta H is the preferred expression for measurements at constant pressure because it simplifies the description of energy transfer. When matter transfer into or out of the system is also prevented, the enthalpy change equals the energy exchanged with the environment by heat. Change in enthalpy, as we mentioned previously, is measured as the difference in the energy content or enthalpy of the products in relation to the reactants. So the change in enthalpy or delta H of a reaction is computed as the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. Thus, when a chemical reaction releases heat, as is shown here, it is said to be exothermic. The heat content of the products is less than that of the reactants, and thus delta H has a negative value. On the other hand, when reacting systems take up heat from their surroundings, these reactions are considered endothermic and have positive values of delta H or change in enthalpy. This means the heat content of the products is more than the heat content of the reactants. The second law of thermodynamics states that the universe always tends toward increasing disorder. To paraphrase, in all natural processes, the entropy of the universe increases. Living organisms consist of collections of molecules much more highly organized than the surrounding materials from which they are constructed from. And organisms maintain and produce order seemingly oblivious to the second law of thermodynamics. But living organisms do not violate the second law. They operate strictly within it. To discuss the application of the second law to biological systems, we must first define those systems and their surroundings. To continue, the reacting system is a collection of matter that is undergoing a particular chemical or physical process. It may be an organism, a cell, or two reacting compounds. In the example we will use later to explain change in entropy, the system will be the tea kettle and the universe is the kitchen. The reacting system and its surroundings together constitute the universe. Living cells and organisms are open systems, exchanging both material and energy with their surroundings. Additionally, living systems are never at equilibrium with their surroundings, and the constant transactions between a system and surroundings explain how organisms can create order within themselves while operating within the second law of thermodynamics. Let us now define what entropy means. Entropy, indicated as a capital letter S, is a quantitative expression for the randomness or disorderliness of a system. When the products of a reaction are less complex and more disordered than the reactants, the reaction is said to proceed with a gain in entropy. It is positive when randomness increases and is negative when randomness or disorderliness is decreased. Entropy came from the Greek word tropos, meaning transformation or a change within. To further understand entropy in the context of biological systems, let us lo look into the analogy of the tea kettle and the randomization of heat. We know that steam generated from boiling water can do useful work. But suppose we turn off the burner under a tea kettle full of water at 100 degrees centigrade, which represents the system in the kitchen or the surroundings and allow the tea kettle to cool down. As it cools down, no work is done, but heat passes from the tea kettle to the surroundings, raising the temperature of the surroundings, the kitchen in this case by an infinitesimally small amount until complete equilibrium is attained. At this point, all parts of the tea kettle and the kitchen are at precisely the same temperature. The free energy that was once concentrated in the tea kettle of hot water at 100 degrees centigrade, potentially capable of doing work, has disappeared. Its equivalent in heat energy is still present in the tea kettle plus kitchen or the universe but has become completely randomized throughout. The energy is no longer available to do work because there is no temperature differential within the kitchen. Moreover, the increase in entropy of the kitchen or the surroundings is irreversible. 
we know from everyday experience that heat never spontaneously passes back from the kitchen into the tea kettle to raise the temperature of the water to 100 degrees centigrade again. What happened here is an increase in entropy or the state of disorderliness in the universe. Moving on, all processes tend to progress toward the situation of maximum entropy as we have seen in the tea kettle analogy. Thus, it is easy to see now that creating and maintaining order within a system like the cell requires work and energy. DNA, RNA, and proteins are informational macromolecules. In addition to using chemical energy to form the covalent bonds between the subunits in these polymers, the cell must invest energy to order the subunits in their correct sequence. It is extremely improbable that amino acids in a mixture would spontaneously condense into a single type of protein with a unique sequence. This would represent increased order in a population of molecules. But according to the second law of thermodynamics, the tendency in nature is toward ever greater disorder in the universe. The total entropy of the universe is continually increasing. Thus, to bring about the synthesis of macromolecules from their monomeric units, free energy must be supplied to the system, in this case, the cell. To reiterate, the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe increases during all chemical and physical processes, but it does not require that the entropy increase takes place in the reacting system itself. The order produced within cells as they grow and divide is more than compensated for by the disorder they create in their surroundings during growth and division. In short, living organisms preserve their internal order by taking from the surroundings free energy in the form of nutrients or sunlight and returning to their surroundings an equal amount of energy as heat and entropy. To continue, the total entropy of a system must increase if a process is to occur spontaneously. Entropy represents the energy of a system that is unavailable for work. Remember, entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness in a system. It is work expended to bring a system to an ordered manner. All processes must tend to progress toward the situation of maximum entropy. Living systems that are highly ordered are never at equilibrium with their surroundings, as equilibrium in a system will result when randomness or disorder is at a maximum. We will now relate the second law of thermodynamics to the first law, as we will see in the next few slides. Having revisited and studied the two laws of thermodynamics governing biochemistry and metabolism, we are now ready to apply such to the energy changes during chemical reactions. J. Willard Gibbs, an American chemist who we will meet, we meet later, developed the theory of energy changes during chemical reactions. He postulated and successfully elucidated that the free energy content, symbol, symbolized as the capital letter G, of any closed systems can be defined in terms of three thermodynamic quantities. The first is enthalpy, or age, refle reflecting the number and kinds of bonds within the reacting system. Entropy, or S, representing the disorderliness of the systems before and after the reaction, and the absolute temperature in degrees Kelvin. He came to the conclusion that the defined free energy into this equation is Change in free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy. When a chemical reaction occurs at constant temperature, the free energy change, or delta G, is determined by the enthalpy change, or delta H, reflecting the kinds and numbers of chemical bonds and non-covalent interactions broken and formed, and the entropy change, or delta S, describing the change in the system's randomness. All chemical reactions are influenced by two forces, the tendency to achieve the most stable bonding state for which enthalpy H is a useful expression and the tendency to achieve the highest degree of randomness expressed as entropy or S. The net driving force in a reaction is delta G, the free energy change, which represents the net effect of these two factors. Taking this further and analyzing the equation, we can see that delta S, or change in entropy, has a positive sign, 
when entropy increases and delta H or change in enthalpy has a negative sign when heat is released by the system to its surroundings. Either of these conditions, which are typical of favorable processes, tend to make the change in free energy or delta G negative. In fact, the, the delta G of a spontaneously reacting system is always negative. The units of delta G and delta H are joules per mole or calories per mole, while the units of entropy are joules per mole Kelvin. Heat as a form of energy is not useful to the cell. Chemical energy in the form of ATP would be most useful. Going back to Josiah Willard Gibbs, he was an American chemist who related chemical, electrical, and thermal energy and their capacity to perform work. These potential energies would be called Gibbs free energy. He also independently invented the mathematics of vector analysis. The thermodynamic quantity Gibbs free energy, or G, named after him, expresses the amount of energy capable of doing work during a reaction at constant temperature and pressure. It expresses the amount of available energy that can be extracted and harnessed from a closed system that can be used to do useful work. In computing for the change in free energy or delta G, one has always to take the difference between the free energy of the products and that of the free energy of the reactants. Or to put it in another way, delta G is the difference between the free energy levels of the final and initial intermediates. In short, it should be final minus initial or products minus reactants. Thereby, delta G expresses the amount of energy capable of doing work during a reaction at constant temperature and pressure. More importantly, it allows one to predict the feasibility of a reaction the direction of chemical reaction either towards the products or will favor the reactants and the exact equilibrium position once the concentration of the reactants and products are the same. In studying the concept of change in free energy or delta G, we can see that this important thermodynamic quantity will reveal to us these very important points. First, that delta G represents the free energy change at any point during transformation. Secondly, the value of delta G could determine the extent of the reaction and whether the work is performed in a reaction. Thirdly, free energy change or delta G represents the maximum amount of chemical energy that is potentially available for doing useful work. It is a valid method for predicting the feasibility of a reaction. And lastly, any transformation may be described by comparing the physical and chemical properties of the initial and final states of a system or a reaction. This energy diagram shown here represents three possible energy scenarios of reactions that will give different values in free energy change or delta G. Let's look at these energy scenarios more closely. This scenario is where the free energy level of the products is lower than that of the reactants. Thus, if we're going to apply this equation, the result will be Delta G or change in free energy is less than zero, or a value that is negative, meaning that the reaction is ex exergonic and can spontaneously occur. This is a favorable reaction. An exergonic reaction could occur by itself and is usually associated with the loss of energy. An exothermic reaction releases energy as heat, as in this case. On the other hand, this is an energy diagram of a reaction where the free energy level of the products is higher than that of the reactants. Thus, if we're going to apply this equation, the result will be the change in free energy or delta G value is more than zero or has a positive value. This means that the reaction is non-spontaneous and requires addition of energy to go to completion. Therefore, this is an endergonic reaction where the products will be associated with an increase in free energy. This reaction likewise takes up heat energy and is called an endothermic reaction. To continue, when the free energy level of both the products and the reactants are equal, the change in free energy or delta G will be zero, or the reaction system has achieved equilibrium. When a system is at equilibrium, the rate of product formation 
exactly equals the rate at which product is converted back to the reactants. Thus, there is no net change in the concentration of reactants and products and a steady state is achieved. The energy change as the system moves from its initial state to equilibrium with no changes in temperature or pressure is given by the free energy change or delta G. Let us now proceed to the concept of the standard free energy change represented by the notation delta G naught prime. The standard free energy change is an alternative mathematical way of expressing a chemical reaction's equilibrium constant. It is the difference between the free energy content of the products and the free energy content of the reactants under standard conditions, specifically at one molar concentration of reactants at standard pressure and temperature and at a pH of 7. This quantity also governs that all chemical reactions tend to go in the direction that results in a decrease in the free energy of the system. And lastly, standard free energy change shows where the final equilibrium for a reaction lies, but tell, tells us nothing about how fast the equilibrium will be achieved. The rates of reactions are governed by the parameters of kinetics, a different topic altogether. The central issue in bioenergetics, the study of energy transformations in living systems, is the means by which energy from fuel metabolism or light capture is coupled to a cell's energy requiring reactions. This brings us to the important biochemical concept of energy coupling, that of thermodynamically unfavored reaction can be driven by being coupled to thermodynamically favored reaction. It is a state where the output of chemical energy from exergonic reaction serves as the input of chemical energy that will drive energonic reaction to completion. In thinking about energy coupling, it is useful to consider a simple mechanical analogy. An object at the top of an inclined plane has a certain amount of potential energy as a result of its elevation. It tends to slide down the plane, losing its potential energy of position as, as it approaches the ground. When an appropriate string and pulley device couples the falling object to another, smaller object, the spontaneous downward motion of the larger can lift the smaller, accomplishing a certain amount of work. The amount of energy available to do work is the free energy change, or delta G. This is always somewhat less than the theoretical amount of energy released because some energy is dissipated as the heat of friction. The greater the elevation of the larger object, the greater the energy released, or delta G, as the object slides downwards, and the greater the amount of work that can be accomplished. Let us now apply this concept biochemically. Let us consider the following reactions. In reaction 1, the formation of glucose 6-phosphate from glucose and inorganic phosphate yields a product of higher energy than the two reactants. For this endergonic reaction, delta G1 is positive. In reaction 2, the exergonic breakdown of adenosine triphosphate can drive an endergonic reaction when the two reactions are coupled. As we can see, the exergonic reaction is a large negative free energy change or delta G2 and the endergonic reaction is a smaller positive free energy change or delta G1. The third reaction accomplishes the sums of reactions 1 and 2 and the free energy change or delta G3 is the arithmetic sum of delta G1 and delta G2. Because delta G3 is negative, the overall reaction is exergonic and will thus proceed spontaneously. The standard free energy changes of coupled reactions are additive. Free energy changes for chemical reactions can be added and subtracted to give free energy changes for other chemical reactions. Reactions in which chemical bonds are formed between two organic molecules are usually catalyzed by enzymes that transfer energy from cleavage of ATP in a phosphoryl transfer reaction or by enzymes that cleave a high energy bond in an activated intermediate of the pathway. This princip principle of bioenergetics explains how a thermodynamically unfavorable or endergonic reaction can be driven 
in the forward direction by coupling it to a highly exergonic reaction through a common intermediate. This is a specific example to illustrate this principle in tangible terms. Let's look at the basic reaction that you will meet early in your study of metabolic processes. The synthesis of glucose 6-phosphate, the first step in the utilization of glucose by many organisms. The reaction glucose plus inorganic phosphate giving rise to glucose 6-phosphate has a standard free energy change of positive 3.3 kcal per mole. The positive value of the free energy change predicts that under standard conditions, the reaction will tend not to proceed spontaneously in the direction written. On the other hand, another cellular reaction, the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate is very exergonic with a large standard free energy change of about negative 7.3 kcal per mole. These two reactions share the common intermediates inorganic phosphate and water and may be expressed as sequential reactions as follows. Glucose plus ATP resulting to glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP <clears throat> with a standard free energy change of negative 4.0 kcal per mole. So the overall standard free energy change is obtained by adding the G values for the individual reactions. Again, resulting to negative 4.0 kcal per mole standard free energy change for the reaction. The overall reaction is exergonic. In this case, the energy stored in ATP is used to drive the synthesis of glucose 6-phosphate, even though its formation from glucose and inorganic phosphate is endergonic. The pathway of glucose 6-phosphate formation by phosphoryl transferase transfer from ATP is different from reactions 1 and 2 above, but the net result is the same as the sum of the two reactions. In thermodynamic calculations, all that matters is the state of the system at the beginning of the process and its state at the end. The, the route between the initial and final states is immaterial. Another representation of the additive property of coupled reactions. The overall change in free energy of the overall or net reaction is just the arithmetic sum of the change in free energies of the two coupled reactions. Again, to reiterate, the free energy change for a reaction is independent of the pathway by which the reaction occurs. Free energy changes are additive. The net chemical reaction that results from successive reactions sharing a common intermediate has an overall free energy change that is just the sum of the delta G values for the individual reactions. This common intermediate strategy is employed by all living cells in the synthesis of metabolic intermediates and cellular components. The common intermediate mentioned mostly used in coupled reactions are usually compounds of high energy potential that will couple both the exergonic and endergonic reactions together. This common intermediate is usually a high-energy compound that will not only bridge the two reactions together, but will be involved in the transfer of energy to direct both reactions to completion. Let us now move on to compounds of high energy. Many biochemical pathways form activated intermediates containing high-energy bonds to facilitate biochemical work. The term high energy bond is a biologic term defined by the standard free energy for ATP hydrolysis. Any bond that can be hydrolyzed with the release of approximately as much or more energy than ATP is called a high energy bond. The high energy bond in activated intermediates, for example, such as UDP glucose in glycogen synthesis, facilitate energy transfer. High energy compounds are those that contain one or more high energy bonds and liberate about negative 7 to negative 15 kilocalories per mole of free energy when hydrolyzed. High energy compounds participate in the flow of cellular energy. Among the high energy compounds mentioned, ATP occupies central importance. This table lists down the high energy bond compounds you will commonly meet in the next lectures. These are, in the order of decreasing standard free energy change, is as follows. Phosphoenol pyruvate, 
carbamyl phosphate, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, creatine phosphate, and of course, the benchmark, adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Let's now examine adenosine triphosphate or ATP and discover why it is considered a high-energy compound. The figure shown on the left summarizes the chemical basis for the relatively large negative standard free energy of the hydrolysis of ATP. The hydrolytic cleavage of the terminal phosphoric acid anhydride or phosphoanhydride bond in ATP separates one of the three negatively charged phosphates and thus relieves some, some of the electrostatic repulsion in ATP. The inorganic phosphate release is stabilized by the formation of several resonance forms not possible in ATP. And ADP negative 2, the other product of hydrolysis immediately ionizes, releasing hydrogen into the medium of very low hydrogen ion concentration of about 10 to the negative 7 molar. Because the concentrations of the direct products of ATP hydrolysis are in the cell far below the concentrations at equilibrium, the mass action favors the hydrolysis reaction in the cell. Although the hydrolysis of ATP is highly exergonic, with a standard free energy change of negative 7.3 kilocalorie per mole or negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole, the molecule is kinetically stable at pH 7 because the activation energy for ATP hydrolysis is relatively high. Rapid cleavage of the phosphoanhydride bonds occurs only when catalyzed by an enzyme. Adenosine triphosphate plays a central role in metabolism. ATP is the shared chemical intermediate linking energy releasing to energy requiring cell processes. Its role in the cell is analogous to that of money in an economy. It is earned or produced in exergonic reactions and spent or consumed in endergonic ones. <clears throat> the overall network of enzyme catalyzed pathways constitute cellular metabolism. ATP is the major connecting link or the shared intermediate between the catabolic and anabolic components of this network. The pathways of enzyme-catalyzed reactions that act on the main constituents of cells, proteins, fats, sugars, and nucleic acids are virtually identical in all living organisms. Probably the highest energy-containing compound is phosphoenol pyruvate or PEP. PEP contains a phosphate ester bond that undergoes hydrolysis to yield the enol form of pyruvate, and this direct product can immediately tautomerize to the more stable keto form of pyruvate. Because the reactant, phosphoenol pyruvate, has only one form, the enol form, and the product, which is pyruvate, has two possible forms, the product is stabilized relative to the reactant. This is the greatest contributing factor to the high standard free energy of hydrolysis of phosphoenol pyruvate, having a standard free energy change of almost twice that of ATP, that is, negative 14.8 kilocalorie per mole or negative 61.9 kilojoules per mole. Another high energy 3 carbon compound is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate which contains an anhydride bond between the carboxyl group at C1 and phosphoric acid. Hydrolysis of this acyl phosphate is accompanied by a large negative standard free energy change of negative 12.3 kilocalorie per mole or negative 49.3 kilojoules per mole, which can again be explained in terms of the structure of reactants and products. When water is added across the anhydride bond of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, one of the direct products, 3-phosphoglyceric acid, can immediately lose a proton to give the carboxylate ion 3-phosphoglycerate, which has two equally probable resonance forms. Removal of the direct product, 3-phosphoglyceric acid, and formation of the resonance-stabilized ion favor the forward reaction. In phosphocreatine, the phosphorus-nitrogen bond can be hydrolyzed to generate free creatine and inorganic phosphate. The release of inorganic phosphate and the resonance stabilization of creatine favor the forward reaction. The standard free energy change of phosphocreatine 
hydrolysis is again large at negative 10.3 kilocalories per mole or negative 43.0 kilojoules per mole. In all these phosphate releasing reactions, the several resonance forms available to inorganic phosphates stabilize this product relative to the reactant, contributing to an already negative free energy change. Low energy compounds, on the other hand, are those that yield less than negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole or less than negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole when bonds are hydrolyzed. Examples are other phosphorylated intermediates like adenosine diphosphate, pyrophosphate, glucose 1-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, adenosine monophosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, and glycerol 3-phosphate. As is evident from the additivity of free energy changes of sequential reactions, any phosphorylated compound can be synthesized by coupling the synthesis to the breakdown of another phosphorylated compound with a more negative free energy of hydrolysis. For example, because cleavage of inorganic phosphate from phosphoenol pyruvate or PEP releases more energy than is needed to drive the condensation of inorganic phosphate with ADP, the direct donation of a phosphoryl group from PEP to ADP to form ATP is thermodynamically feasible as is shown here. Much of catabolism is directed toward the synthesis of high-energy phosphate compounds, but their formation is not an end in itself. They are the means of activating a very wide variety of compounds for further chemical transformation. The transfer of a phosphoryl group to a compound effectively puts free energy into that compound so that it has more free energy to give up during subsequent metabolic transformations. Okay, let us now move on to the next segment. This concept is basic but crucial to the study of energy transductions in the cell. This is the concept of biological oxidation from which all energy comes from and what we can say makes life possible. Biological oxidation is the type of oxidation which occurs in biological systems to produce energy. Oxidation in the cell can occur in several ways the least common route of which is via the addition of oxygen. Another way is with the removal of hydrogen, but the most common route is through the direct removal of electrons. Electrons, however, are not stable in the free state, so their removal from a substance or oxidation must be accompanied by their acceptance by another substance or the process of reduction. Hence, the reaction is called oxidation, reduction, reaction, or redox reaction, and the involved enzymes are called oxidoreductases. The flow of electrons in oxidation, reduction, reactions is responsible directly or indirectly for all work done by living organisms. As a review, remember that the electron donating molecule in an oxidation reduction reaction is called the reducing agent or the reductant. On the other hand, the electron accepting molecule is the oxidizing agent or the oxidant. A given agent such as an iron cation existing in the ferrous or iron plus two or ferric or iron plus three states, as we will see in the next slide, functions as a conjugate reductant oxidant or redox pair, similar to an acid and corresponding base function as a conjugate acid base pair. Let us now look at a particular example, the oxidation of ferrous ion by cupric ion. Although oxidation and reduction must occur together, it is convenient when describing electron transfers to consider the two halves of an oxidation-reduction reaction separately. Let's revisit certain caveats. Oxidation, as we know, is defined as the loss of electrons. Thus, with the loss of electrons, ferrous or iron plus two will have an increase in oxidation state and become ferric or iron plus 3 because it has lost an electron and its charge increased from plus 2 to plus 3. Consequently, reduction is defined as a gain of electrons. With the gain of electrons, cupric or copper plus 2 will have a decrease in oxidation state to become cuprous or copper plus 1. 
This is because the copper ion has gained an electron and its charge decreased from plus 2 to plus 1. In redox reactions, we can write a similar general equation as such. Electron donor equals electron plus electron acceptor. In the reversible half reaction 1 shown here, ferrous or iron plus 2 is the electron donor and ferric or iron plus 3 is the electron acceptor. Together, ferrous and ferric constitute a conjugate redox pair. Similarly, in the reversible half reaction 2, again shown here, cupric or copper plus 2 is the electron acceptor, while cuprous or copper plus 1 is the electron donor. Again, together, copper plus 2 and copper plus 1 constitute a conjugate redox pair. Most of the time, oxidation or the loss of electrons is coincident with the loss of hydrogen. In biological systems, oxidation is often synonymous with dehydrogenation, and many enzymes that catalyze oxidation reactions are termed aside from being oxidoreductases as dehydrogenases. Notice that the more reduced compounds are richer in hydrogen, in this case alcohol shown here, whereas the more oxidized compounds, for example acetaldehyde shown here, have less hydrogen. As you have learned from your lectures in enzymes and coenzymes, dehydrogenation or oxidation reduction reactions are catalyzed by oxidoreductases or dehydrogenases. These are enzymes that oxidize a substrate by a reduction reaction that transfers one or more hydrides to an electron acceptor, usually NAD or NADP or a flavin coenzyme such as FAD or FMN. Moving on, let us now look into the various ways how electrons are transferred among atoms or molecules. Electrons are transferred from the electron donor to the electron acceptor in one of four different ways. All four types occur in cells. First, electrons are transferred directly as electrons. For example, the ferrous ferric redox pair can transfer an electron to the cuprous cupric redox pair as what we have seen several slides back. Secondly, electrons can be transferred as hydrogen atoms. Recall that a hydrogen atom consists of a proton or a hydrogen ion and a single electron. In this case, we can write the general equation as such. As a caution, please do not mistake this reaction for an acid dissociation. The electron transferred arises from the removal of a hydrogen atom that includes both proton or hydrogen ion and an electron. This is not just a proton or hydrogen ion as what occurs in acid dissociations. Thirdly, electrons are transferred in the form of a hydride ion, which has two electrons. This occurs in the case of NAD-linked dehydrogenases as shown here. And lastly, electrons are transferred via direct combination with oxygen. In this case, oxygen combines with an organic reductant and is covalently incorporated in the product as in the oxidation of a hydrocarbon to an alcohol. The hydrocarbon is the electron donor, while the oxygen atom is the electron acceptor. All four types of electron transfer occur in cells. The neutral term reducing equivalent is commonly used to designate a single electron equivalent participating in an oxidation reduction reaction no matter whether this equivalent is an electron per se, a hydrogen atom, or a hydride ion, or whether the electron transfer takes place in a reaction with oxygen to yield an oxygenated product. However, because biological fuel molecules are usually enzymatically dehydrogenated to lose two reducing equivalents at a time, and because each oxygen atom can accept two reducing equivalents, biochemists by convention regard the unit of biological oxidations as two reducing equivalents passing from substrate to oxygen. Let's now move on to the concept of reduction potential. When two conjugate redox pairs are together in solution, electron transfer from the electron donor of one pair to the electron acceptor of the other may proceed spontaneously. 
The tendency for such a reaction depends on the relative affinity of the electron acceptor of each redox pair for electrons. The standard reduction potential, notated as E01 with unit in volts, is a measure of this affinity. Hydrogen has the lowest redox potential at negative 0.42 volts, while oxygen has the highest redox potential at plus 0.82 volts. The redox potentials of all other substances lie between that of hydrogen and oxygen. The relative positions of redox systems allow prediction of the direction of flow of electrons from one redox couple to another. The usefulness of reduction potential stems from the fact that when redox potential or E values have been determined for any two half cells relative to the standard hydrogen electrode, their reduction potentials relative to each other are, are also known. We can then predict the direction in which electrons will tend to flow. When the two half cells are connected to an external circuit or when components of both half cells are present in the same solution, electrons tend to flow to the half cell with the more positive E and the strength of the tendency is proportional to the difference in reduction potentials or delta E. It is thus possible to calculate the free energy change for any biological redox reaction at any concentration of the redox pairs. This table lists the standard deduction potentials of various half reactions of oxidation reduction reactions occurring in the cell. Again, please recall that the standard deduction potential measures the tendency of a chemical species to acquire electrons and thereby be reduced. As seen in the table here, pyridoxine has the greatest tendency to donate electrons, having the lowest or most negative standard reduction potential at negative 0.432 volt. This is followed by hydrogen at 0.42 volt. Oxygen, on the other hand, as shown here, has the highest redox potential at positive 0.82 volt. This indicates oxygen as the atom or molecule with the greatest tendency to accept electrons as shown by it having the highest standard redox potential. Therefore, oxygen is usually referred to as the ultimate acceptor of electrons in the cell. Additionally, the redox potential of all other substances lie between that of ferredoxine and oxygen. The relative positions of redox systems allow prediction of the direction of flow of electrons from one redox couple to another. Knowing the standard deduction potentials of the two half reactions in a redox reaction is powerful. It is because the standard deduction potentials can be used to calculate the free energy change of the reaction as what can be seen from the equation shown here. Again, remember that electrons tend to flow to the half cell with the more positive standard reduction potential and the strength of that tendency is proportional to the difference in standard reduction potential. I spared you the nosebleed in the derivation of this equation associating standard free energy change of a reaction to that of the standard reduction potentials of its corresponding two half reactions. Let us just accept the relationship that the energy made available by this spontaneous electron flow or the free energy change or delta G for the oxidation reduction reaction is proportional to the standard reduction potential difference. In this equation, N represents the number of electrons transferred in the reaction. With this equation, we can calculate the free energy change for any oxidation reduction reaction from the values of E in a table of reduction potentials certain known constants and the concentrations of the species participating in the reaction. We have mentioned that it is the transfer of electrons that is responsible for most of energy generation within the cell and subsequently most of the work done. The principles of oxidation reduction energetics described previously apply to the many metabolic reactions that involve electron transfers. For example, in many organisms, the oxidation of glucose supplies energy for the production of ATP. Cells convert glucose to carbon dioxide not in a single high-energy releasing reaction, but rather in a series of controlled reactions, some of which are oxidations. 
Electrons removed from these oxidation steps are transferred to coenzymes specialized for carrying electrons, also known as the universal electron carriers. You have previously discussed most of this in your lecture in coenzymes, but it is worth revisiting to put them in the proper context of our current discussion. The multitude of enzymes that catalyze cellular oxidations channel electrons from their hundreds of different substrates into just a few types of universal electron carriers. The reduction of these carriers in catabolic processes results in the conservation of free energy released by substrate oxidation. These coenzymes undergo reversible oxidation and reduction in many of the electron transfer reactions of metabolism. These include the nucleotides NAD and NADP that move readily from one enzyme to another, the flavin nucleotides FMN and FAD, which are usually very tightly bound to the enzymes, called flavoproteins for which they serve as prosthetic groups. The lipid-soluble quinones such as ubiquinone and plastoquinone which act as electron carriers and proton donors in the non-aqueous environment of membranes. And lastly, the iron sulfur proteins and cytochromes which have tightly bound prosthetic groups that undergo reversible oxidation and reduction. These also serve as electron carriers in many oxidation reduction reactions. Let us start with the pyridine nucleotides. The nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide with NAD in its oxidized form and its close analog nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate or NADP are composed of two nucleotides joined to their phosphate groups by a phosphoanhydride bond. Because the nicotinamide ring resembles pyridine, these compounds are sometimes called pyridine nucleotides. Both coenzymes undergo reversible reduction of the nicotinamide ring accepting a hydride ion, which we remember is comprised of a proton with two electrons. The vitamin niacin is the source of the nicotinamide moiety in the nicotinamide nucleotides. Both NAD and NADP coenzymes undergo reversible reduction of the nicotinamide ring as shown here. As a substrate molecule undergoes oxidation or dehydrogenation, giving up two hydrogen atoms, the oxidized form of the nucleotide, NAD or NADP, accepts a hydride ion, the equivalent of a proton and two electrons, and is transformed into the reduced form NADH or NADPH. The second proton removed from the substrate is released to the aqueous solvent. The half reaction for each type of nucleotide is shown here. On the other hand, flavoproteins are enzymes that catalyze oxidation reduction reactions using either flavin mononucleotide, FMN, or flavin adenine dinucleotide, FADS coenzyme. These coenzymes, the flavin nucleotides, are derived from the vitamin riboflavin. The fused ring structure of flavin nucleotides, the isoaloxacin ring, undergoes reversible reduction, accepting either one or two electrons in the form of one or two hydrogen atoms from a reduced substrate. Remember, each hydrogen atom contains an electron plus a proton. The fully reduced forms are abbreviated as FADH2 and FMNH2. Let's look more closely at the flavin nucleotides. Flavin mononucleotide consists of the structure above the dashed line on the flavin adenine dinucleotide, its oxidized form. Remember again that the flavin nucleotides accept two hydrogen atoms, composed of two electrons and two protons, both of which appear in the flavin ring system. When a fully oxidized flavin nucleotide accepts only one electron, one hydrogen atom, the semiquinone form of the isoaloxacin ring is produced, abbreviated as FDH dot and FMNH dot. Because flavoproteins can participate in either one or two electron transfers, this class of proteins is involved in a greater diversity of reactions than the pyridine nucleotide dih dihydrogenases. In addition to NAD and flavoproteins, Three other types of electron-carrying molecules function in the respiratory chain, a hydrophobic quinone, ubiquinone, and two different types of iron-containing proteins, 
the cytochromes and the iron sulfur proteins. Ubiquinone, also called coenzyme Q or simply Q, is a lipid-soluble benzoquinone with a long isoprenoid side chain. Ubiquinone can accept one electron to become the semiquinone radical QH or two electrons to form ubiquinol or QH2. And like flavoprotein protein carriers, it can act at the junction between a two-electron donor and a one-electron acceptor. Because ubiquinone is both small and hydrophobic, it is freely diffusible within the lipid bilayer of the inner mitochondrial membrane and can shuttle reducing equivalents between other, less mobile electron carriers in the membrane. And because it carries both electrons and protons, it plays a central role in coupling electron flow to proton movement. This slide shows the complete reduction of ubiquinone. The process requires two electrons and two protons and occurs in two steps to the semiquinone radical intermediate. This illustration shows ubiquinone accepting one electron to become the semiquinone radical QH or two electrons forming ubiquinol or QH2. This makes ubiquinone versatile in one electron or two electrons exchanges. The cytochromes, on the other hand, are proteins with characteristic strong absorption of visible light due to their iron-containing heme prosthetic groups. Mitochondria contain three classes of cytochromes, designated as A, B, and C, which are distinguished by the differences in their light absorption spectra. The standard reduction potential of the heme iron atom of a cytochrome depends on its interaction with protein side chains and is therefore different for each cytochrome. Each group of cytochromes consists of four five-membered nitrogen-containing rings in a cyclic structure called a porphyrin. The four nitrogen atoms are coordinated with the central iron ion, either existing in the ferrous or ferric form. The conjugated double band system, shaded pink as is shown here, of the porphyrin ring accounts for the absorption of visible light by these hemes. Lastly, let us look into the iron sulfur proteins. In these proteins, the iron is present not in heme but in association with inorganic sulfur atoms or with the sulfur atoms of cysteine residues in the protein or both. These iron sulfur centers range from the simple structures with a single iron atom coordinated to four cysteine groups or to the more complex iron sulfur centers with two or four iron atoms. All iron sulfur proteins participate in one electron transfers in which one iron atom of the iron sulfur cluster is oxidized or is reduced. Oxidative phosphorylation is the culmination of all energy yielding metabolism in aerobic organisms. Let us now explore this crucial biochemical phenomenon up close and personal. All oxidative steps in the degradation of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins converge at this final stage of cellular respiration in which the energy of oxidation drives the synthesis of ATP. Simply stated, oxidative phosphorylation involves the reduction of oxygen to water with electrons donated by oxidation of complex ma macromolecules carried by the universal electron carriers like NADH and FADH2. Phosphorylation for ATP synthesis is of two types. These are substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative or respiration linked phosphorylation. Let us now study each type and differentiate them in the next few slides. To start off, the first type of phosphorylation that we are going to study is substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation is defined as the metabolic reaction that results in the formation of adenosine triphosphate or guanosine triphosphate by conversion of a higher energy substrate, whether phosphate group attached or not, into a lower energy product. And using some of the released chemical energy that gives free energy to transfer a phosphoryl group to ADP or GDP from another phosphorylated compound. Unlike oxidative phosphorylation, 
oxid oxidation and phosphorylation are not coupled in the process of substrate level phosphorylation and the active intermediates are most often gained in the course of oxidation processes in catabolism. Most ATP is generated by oxidative phosphorylation in aerobic or anaerobic respiration, while substrate level phosphorylation provides a quicker, less efficient source of ATP independent of external electron acceptors. This is the case in human erythrocytes, which have no mitochondria, and in oxygen-depleted muscles. Additionally, substrate level phosphorylation occurs through the direct cleavage of high energy bonds and then coupling this to the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. This process involves soluble enzymes and chemical intermediates, for example, like 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate in glycolysis. Let's illustrate this with tangible examples. Substrate level phosphorylation exists in glycolysis. In the oxidation of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and phosphoenolpyruvate, which we learned are high energy compounds. The energy release from the oxidation of these two intermediates are higher than what is needed for the phosphorylation of ADP to produce ATP. The ATP yield might be very low, but this is a lot quicker and can happen in cells without mitochondria, like the red blood cells, or even in oxygen depleted tissues. Oxidative phosphorylation, on the other hand, involves the reduction of oxygen to water with electrons donated by NADH and FADH2. This type of phosphorylation involves membrane-bound enzymes and transmembrane gradients of protons and occurs through oxidation of substrates in the electron transport chain. It is also known as the electron transport link phosphorylation. This involves the transfer of reducing equivalents in the chain which produces energy and is captured via phosphorylation of ADP and inorganic phosphate to ATP. Thus, basically, this involves the coupling of biologic oxidation or simply respiration with phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is the culmination of energy yielding metabolism in aerobic organisms. Oxidative phosphorylation begins with the entry of electrons into the respiratory chain. Most of these electrons arise from the action of dehydrogenases that collect electrons from catabolic pathways and funnel them into universal electron acceptors. Nicotinamide nucleotides NAD or NADP or flavin nucleotides FMN or FAD. In addition to NAD and flavoproteins, three other types of electron-carrying molecules function in the respiratory chain. These are ubiquinone, cytochromes, and the different iron sulfur proteins. Oxidative phosphorylation involves the process wherein electrons pass to a series of membrane-bound carriers, which is known as the electron transport chain. The mitochondrial respiratory chain consists of a series of sequentially acting electron carriers, most of which are integral proteins with prosthetic groups capable of accepting and donating either one or two electrons. Three types of electron transfers occur in oxidative phosphorylation. We have studied this previously, but it's worth mentioning again. Electrons are transferred as electrons, as hydrogen atoms, and as hydride ions which carry two electrons. The electron transport chain, abbreviated as ETC, is the overall reaction catalyzed by the mitochondrial respiratory chain, where electrons move from NADH succinate or some other primary electron donor to flavoproteins, ubiquinone, iron, sulfur proteins, and cytochromes, and finally to the ultimate acceptor of electrons, molecular oxygen. In this illustration, this blue arrow showed the path of electron transport from NADH to oxygen. As electrons pass through the chain, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space, thereby establishing an electrochemical potential gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. This electrochemical potential will now be harnessed in the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP within the mitochondria. 
Before we dive straight into the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, it is prudent for us to at least revisit the very important organelle where these processes will be occurring, in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is a double-membraned organelle where the electron transport chain is housed and is responsible for energy production, earning it the moniker of being the powerhouse of the cell. The outer mitochondrial membrane is readily permeable to small molecules and ions, which move freely through transmembrane channels formed by a family of integral membrane proteins called porins. The inner membrane, on the other hand, is impermeable to most small molecules and ions, including protons or hydrogen ions. Protons are one of the few species that can cross this membrane and they can only do so through specific transporters. The inner membrane bears the components of the respiratory chain and the ATP synthase. Moving on, the mitochondrial matrix enclosed by the inner membrane contains vital enzyme systems like the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the citric acid cycle, the fatty acid beta-oxidation pathway, and the pathways of amino acid oxidation. These are almost all the pathways of fuel oxidation except glycolysis, which of course takes place in the cytosol. The selectively permeable inner membrane segregates the intermediates and enzymes of cytosolic metabolic pathways from those of metabolic processes occurring in the matrix. However, specific transporters carry pyruvate, fatty acids, and amino acids or their alpha keto derivatives into the matrix for access to the machinery of the citric acid cycle. ADP and inorganic phosphates are specifically transported into the matrix as newly synthesized ATP is transported out. Here is an image that encapsulates the processes in the electron transport chain happening within the mitochondria. The yellow arrows show the path of electron transport from NADH to oxygen. As electrons pass through the chain, Protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space, thereby establishing an, an electrochemical potential gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. The positive and negative charges on the membrane denote the membrane potential. The electrochemical difference on both sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane drives the protons into the matrix through a pore in the ATP synthase which uses the energy to form ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The electron carriers of the respiratory chain are organized into membrane-embedded supramolecular complexes that can be physically separated. Gentle treatment of the inner mitochondrial membrane with detergents allows the resolution of four unique electron carrier complexes each capable of catalyzing electron transfer through a portion of the chain. Complexes 1 and 2 catalyze electron transfer to ubiquinone from two different electron donors, NADH via complex 1 and succinate via complex 2. Complex 3 carries electrons from the reduced ubiquinone to cytochrome C, and complex 4 completes the sequence by transferring electrons from cytochrome C to molecular oxygen to yield water. We are now ready to look more closely into the different complexes of the electron transport chain. The first is complex 1, also called NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase or simply NADH dehydrogenase. NADH dehydrogenase is a large enzyme composed of 42 different polypeptide chains including an FMN containing flavoprotein and at least six iron sulfur centers. High-resolution electron microscopy shows complex 1 to be L-shaped with one arm of the L in the membrane and the other extending into the matrix. Two processes happen in complex 1. The first is the exergonic transfer of a pair of electrons from NADH to ubiquinone to reduce it to ubiquinol. The flow of electrons from the higher free energy level intermediates to that with a much lower free energy level will yield energy that can be used to do some useful work. Thus, the second process is the endergonic transfer of four protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. 
Complex 1 is therefore a proton pump driven by the energy of electron transfer, and the reaction it catalyzes is vectorial. It moves protons in a specific direction from the matrix to the intermembrane space. As a consequence, the matrix becomes negatively charged with the departure of protons. The intermembrane space, on the other hand, becomes positive because of the influx of protons. To emphasize the vectorial nature of the process, the overall reaction is often written with subscripts that indicate the location of the protons. P is for the positive side of the in inner membrane or the intermembrane space. N is for the negative side, which is the matrix. Ubiquinol or QH2, the fully reduced form of ubiquinone, then diffuses in the inner mitochondrial membrane from complex 1 to complex 3, where it is oxidized back to ubiquinone in a process that also involves the outward movement of protons. Moving on now to complex 2. Complex 2, also known as succinate dehydrogenase, is considered to be the only membrane-bound enzyme in the citric acid cycle. Although smaller and simpler than complex 1, it contains five prosthetic groups of two types and four different protein subunits. The effect of each of these electron transferring enzymes is to contribute to the pool of reduced ubiquinone or ubiquinol or QH2 from all these reactions. The next respiratory complex, complex 3, also called cytochrome's BC1 complex, or ubiquinone cytochrome C oxidoreductase couples the transfer of electrons from ubiquinol or QH2 to cytochrome C with the vectorial transport of protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Based on the structure of complex 3 and detailed by chemical studies of the redox reactions, a reasonable model has been proposed for the passage of electrons and protons through complex 3. The net equation for the redox reactions are shown here. Although the path of the electrons through this segment of the respiratory chain is complicated, the net effect of the transfer is simple. Ubiquinol or QH2 is oxidized back to ubiquinone or Q, and two molecules of cytochrome C are reduced. At the same time, four protons are pumped from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Cytochrome C is a soluble protein of the intermembrane space. After each single heme accepts an electron from complex 3, cytochrome C moves to complex 4 to donate the electron to a binuclear copper center. In the final step of the respiratory chain, complex 4, also called cytochrome C oxidase, carries electrons from cytochrome C to molecular oxygen and reducing it to water. It contains cytochromes A and A3 and the oxygen binding site. A whole oxygen molecule or O2 must accept four electrons to be reduced to two moles of water. Bound copper ions in the cytochrome oxygen complex facilitate the collection of the four electrons and the reduction of the oxygen molecule. To continue, for every four electrons passing through this complex, the enzyme consumes four substrate hydrogen from the matrix or the enzyme in converting an O2 molecule to two moles of water. It also uses the energy of this redox reaction to pump one proton outward into the intermembrane space or the P side for each electron that passes through, adding to the electrochemical potential produced by a redox-driven proton transport through complexes 1 and 3. The overall reaction catalyzed by complex 4 is shown here. This 4-electron reduction of an O2 molecule involves redox centers that carry only one electron at a time, and it must occur without the release of incompletely reduced intermediates such as hydrogen peroxide or hydroxyl free radicals, very reactive species that would damage cellular components. The intermediates remain tightly bound to the complex until completely converted to water. This slide shows a summary of the flow of electrons and protons through the four complexes of the respiratory chain. Electrons reach ubiquinone through complexes 1 and 2, 
Ubiquinol serves as a mobile carrier of electrons and protons. It passes electrons to complex 3, which passes them to another mobile connecting linked cytochrome C. Complex 4 then transfers electrons from reduced cytochrome C to oxygen. Electron flow through complexes 1, 3, and 4 is accompanied by proton flow from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Here is an animated image showing the flow of electrons and the corresponding vectorial translocation of protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space in complexes 1, 3, and 4. The transfer of two electrons from NADH through the respiratory chain to molecular oxygen can be written with this equation. This net reaction is highly exergonic and the standard free energy change calculated is appro approximately negative 220 kilojoules per mole of NADH. Much of this energy is used to pump protons out of the matrix. For each pair of electrons transferred to oxygen, Four protons are pumped out by complex 1, 4 by complex 3, and 2 by complex 4 for a total of 10 protons. The electrochemical energy inherent in this difference in proton concentration and separation of charge represents a temporary conservation of much of the energy of electron transfer. This forms the basis for the proton motive force. Because the transfer of two electrons from NADH to oxygen is accompanied by the outward pumping of 10 hydrogen ions, roughly 200 of the 220 kilojoules released by oxidation of a mole of NADH is conserved in the proton gradient. The energy stored in such a gradient, termed the proton motive force, has two components. First, the chemical potential energy due to the difference in concentration of a chemical species, the hydrogen ions, in the two regions separated by the membrane. Second, the electrical potential energy that results from the separation of charge when a proton moves across the membrane without a counter ion. When protons flow spontaneously down their electrochemical gradient, energy is made available to do work. In mitochondria, chloroplasts, and aerobic bacteria, the electrochemical energy in the proton gradient drives the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So let's now look at how the stored energy, the proton motive force, is harnessed to produce ATP for the energy needs of the cell. How is a concentration gradient of protons transformed into ATP? We have seen that electron transfer releases and the proton motive force conserves more than enough free energy of about 200 kilojoule per mole of electron pairs to drive the formation of a mole of ATP, which requires just about 50 kilojoules. Mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation therefore poses no thermodynamic problem. But what is the chemical mechanism that couples proton flux with phosphorylation? This question was answered when Peter Michel, a British biochemist, was awarded the 1978 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his groundbreaking breakthrough of the chemiosmotic mechanism of ATP synthesis. He coined this discovery as the chemiosmotic coupling hypothesis of oxidative phosphorylation, which eventually became one of the unifying principles of 20th century biology. The chemiosmotic model proposed by Peter Michel is the paradigm for this mechanism. We have seen that the transmembrane differences in proton concentration are the reservoir for the energy extracted from biological oxidation reactions. However, there was still a big piece of the puzzle missing in the chemical mechanism that couples proton flux with phosphorylation to produce ATP. This is where the chemiosmotic hypothesis comes in. According to the model, the electrochemical energy inherent in the difference in proton concentration and separation of charge across the inner mitochondrial membrane, or the proton motive force, drives the synthesis of ATP as protons flow passively back into the matrix through a proton pore associated with ATP synthase. 
Let us try to explain the chemiosmotic model. In this simple representation of the chemiosmotic theory applied to mitochondria, electrons from NAD and other oxidizable substrates pass through a chain of carriers arranged asymmetrically in the inner membrane. Electron flow is accompanied by proton transfer across the membrane, producing both a chemical gradient and an electrical gradient. The inner mitochondrial membrane, as we know, is impermeable to protons. Protons can re-enter the matrix only through proton-specific channels like the FO. The proton motive force that drives protons back into the matrix provides the energy for ATP synthesis, catalyzed by the F1 complex associated with FO of the ATP synthase complex. This is another look at the electron transport chain with the four complexes that we have studied. What is added here is a fifth complex, the ATP synthase, which can also be referred to as complex 5. ATP synthase, officially known as the FOF1 ATPase, is the enzyme complex that generates ATP. It is a multi-subunit enzyme containing an inner membrane portion, known as the FO, and a stalk and headpiece portion, the F1, that projects into the matrix. To continue, the ATP synthase has 12 C subunits in the membrane that form a rotor that is attached to a central asymmetric shaft composed of epsilon and gamma subunits. The headpiece, in turn, is composed of three alpha-beta subunit pairs. Each beta subunit contains a catalytic site for ATP synthesis. The headpiece is held stationary by a delta subunit attached to a long B subunit connected to a subunit A in the membrane. ATP synthase carries out rotational catalysis in which the flow of protons through FO causes each of three nucleotide binding sites in F1 to cycle from ADP plus inorganic phosphate bound to ATP bound to empty conformations. This way, three active sites take turns in catalyzing ATP synthesis. The binding change or flip-flop mechanism theory or the conformational coupling hypothesis elucidated by Paul Boyer in the 1960s and 70s postulated that ATP synthesis is dependent on a conformational change in ATP synthase generated by rotation of the enzyme complex. The changes in the energy states of the different subunits causes a series of events that leads to the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. This is an animated representation of the rotation of the FO portion of the ATP synthase causing conformational changes in the F1 portion or headpiece of the enzyme complex. One can see the entry of the raw materials, ADP and inorganic phosphate, and the release of ATP from the enzyme complex. The binding change mechanism is the key to rotational catalysis. A given beta subunit starts in the beta-ADP conformation which binds ADP and inorganic phosphate from the surrounding medium. The subunit now changes conformation, assuming the beta ATP form that tightly binds and stabilizes ATP, bringing about the red equilibration of ADP plus inorganic phosphate with ATP on the enzyme surface. Finally, the subunit changes to the beta empty conformation, which has very low affinity for ATP and the newly synthesized ATP leaves the enzyme surface. Another round of catalysis begins when this subunit again assumes the beta-ADP form and binds ADP and inorganic phosphate. Here is another view of the binding change mechanism. The binding change mechanism involves the active site of a beta subunit cycling between three states. In the loose state, ADP and the phosphate enter the active site. The enzyme then undergoes a change in shape and forces these molecules together, with the active site in the resulting tight state binding the newly produced ATP molecule with very high affinity. Finally, the active site cycles back to the open state, 
releasing ATP and binding more ADP and phosphate, ready for the next cycle of ATP production. The conformational changes central to this mechanism are driven by the passage of protons to the FO portion of ATP synthase. This in turn turns the FO portion of ATP synthase leading to the conformational changes in the beta subunits of the F1 or head portion of the enzyme complex resulting to the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. The phosphate oxygen ratio or PO ratio refers to the amount of ATP produced from the movement of two electrons through a defined electron transport chain terminated by reduction of an oxygen atom. The PO ratio is dependent on the number of hydrogen ions transported outward across an electrochemical gradient and the number of protons which return inward through the membrane via an enzyme such as ATP synthase. Overall, each NADH donates two electrons equivalent to the reduction of one half of an O2 molecule. A generally but not universally accepted estimate of the stoichiometry of ATP synthesis is that four protons are pumped out at complex one, four protons at complex three, and two at complex four. It has been studied and accepted that ATP synthase complex would need four protons translocated for one ATP synthesized from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Let's explore this important concept in greater detail. Looking at the electron transport chain, a total of 10 protons will be translocated out to the intermembrane space when NADH is oxidized as electron donor at complex 1. With 4 protons translocated for each ATP synthesized, an estimated 2.5 ATPs are formed for each NADH oxidized, resulting to a PO ratio of 2.5. On the other hand, with succinate as electron donor via complex 2, a total of 6 protons are translocated through complexes 3 and 4, resulting to 1.5 ATPs for each of FADH2 containing flavoproteins oxidized, resulting to a PO ratio of 1.5. <clears throat> Modern biochemists and academicians now use the PO values of 2.5 and 1.5, but the values 3.0 and 2.0 are still common in the biochemical literature. Moving on, we have learned that the inner mitochondrial membrane is generally impermeable to charged species and other molecules. How then can ADP, ATP, and phosphate ions move in and out through it? There are two specific transport systems that translocate ADP and inorganic phosphate into the matrix and ATP out to the intermembrane space. The adenine nucleotide translocase, integral to the inner membrane, transports ADP, negative 3, in the intermembrane space and transports it into the matrix in exchange for an ATP, negative 4 molecule that is simultaneously transported outward into the intermembrane space. Because this antiporter moves four negative charges out for every three moved in, its activity is favored by the transmembrane electrochemical gradient, which gives the matrix a net negative charge. Similar to ATP synthase, the proton motive force drives ATP-ADP exchange. A second membrane transport system, essential to oxidative phosphorylation, is phosphate translocase, which promotes Symport of one dihydrogen phosphate or H2PO4 negative and one hydrogen ion into the matrix. Moving on, the NADH dehydrogenase of the inner mitochondrial membrane of animal cells can accept electrons only from the NADH in the matrix. Given that the inner membrane is not permeable to NADH, how then can the NADH generated by glycolysis in the cytosol be reoxidized to NAD positive via the respiratory chain? Special shuttle systems carry reducing equivalents from cytosolic NADH into mitochondria by an indirect route. These are the malate, aspartate, and glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle systems. We will just enumerate them here and not go into the details. 
Suffice it to know that special shuttle systems do exist for this purpose of NADH transport through the impermeable inner mitochondrial membrane. Oxidative phosphorylation is a highly crucial process that it needs to be finely regulated. The rate of respiration or oxygen consumption in the mitochondria is tightly regulated. It is generally limited by the availability of ADP as a substrate for phosphorylation. The intracellular concentration of ADP is one measure of the energy status of cells. Another related measure is the mass action ratio of the ATP-ADP system which is the ATP concentration over the product of the concentrations of ADP and inorganic phosphate. Normally, this ratio is very high, so the ATP-ADP system is almost fully phosphorylated. When the rate of some energy requiring process, like protein synthesis for example, increases, the rate of breakdown of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate increases, lowering the mass action ratio. With more ADP available for oxidative phosphorylation, the rate of respiration increases, causing regeneration of ATP. This continues until the mass action ratio returns to its normal high level, at which point respiration slows down again. The rate of oxidation of cellular fuels is regulated with such sensitivity and precision that the ratio fluctuates only slightly in most tissues even during extreme variations in energy demand. In short, ATP is formed only as fast as it is used in energy requiring cellular activities. Lastly, the relative concentrations of ATP and ADP control not only the rates of electron transfer and oxidative phosphorylation, but also the rates of the citric acid cycle, pyruvate oxidation, and glycolysis. Whenever ATP consumption increases, the rate of electron transfer and oxidative phosphorylation also increases. Simultaneously, the rate of pyruvate oxidation via the citric acid cycle increases, increasing the flow of electrons into the respiratory chain. These events can in turn evoke an increase in the rate of glycolysis and subsequently increasing the rate of pyruvate formation. When conversion of ADP to ATP lowers the ADP con concentration, acceptor control slows electron transfer and thus slows oxidative phosphorylation as well. Let us further investigate the regulation of the ATP producing pathways. This diagram shows the interlocking regulation of glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation by the relative concentrations of ATP, ADP, AMP, and by NADH. High ATP concentrations or low ADP and AMP concentrations produce low rates of glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, acetate oxidation via the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. All four pathways are accelerated when the use of ATP and the formation of ADP, AMP, and inorganic phosphate increases. The interlocking of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle by citrate, which inhibits glycolysis, supplements the action of the adenine nucleotide system. In addition, increased levels of NADH and acetyl-coenzyme A also inhibit the oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and the high NADH NAD ratio inhibits the dehydrogenase reactions of the citric acid cycle. Let's now move on to the different agents that interfere with oxidative phosphorylation. These agents are referred to as poisons since they either disrupt the flow of electrons in the electron transport chain or inhibit ATP synthase. So this agent's overall effect is the diminution or failure to produce ATP for the cell's use. The agents or poisons that disrupt the electron transport chain or the synthesis of ATP via phosphorylation may be classified according to the complex they interfere with or through their mechanisms of action. Let's go through them one by one. This table shown here lists the following poisons according to their mechanisms of action to wit, inhibition of electron transfer, inhibition of ATP synthase, 
uncoupling of phosphorylation from electron transfer, and lastly, inhibition of ATP-ADP exchange. Feel free to pause the presentation to take a longer look at the different agents and their mechanisms of action. The next slide, on the other hand, illustrates the different poisons according to their sites of action, the different complexes including complex 5 or the ATP synthase. Here's a classification of the different agents according to their sites of action. As we can see, we have toxic agents that interfere with electron transfer within complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4. Not shown are the poisons disrupting phosphorylation in complex 5 or the ATP synthase. Let's now go through each of the different agents, but we will classify them according to their mechanism of actions rather than their site of action. The first group includes the small molecules of cyanide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide. As we all know, these are highly toxic chemicals that cause thousands of deaths yearly. The first in the list, cyanide, binds to the ferric ion in the heme of the cytochrome AA3, a component of cytochrome C oxidase and thus prevents electron transport to the ultimate electron acceptor oxygen. Mitochondrial respiration and energy production cease and cell death rapidly occurs. Cyanide is present in automobile exhausts, cigarette smoke, and cyanoglycosides, which are present in edible plants like cassava, almond, soybeans, and a lot more. The central nervous system is the primary target for cyanide toxicity. Carbon monoxide likewise is toxic for mitochondria in man, altering the mitochondrial respiratory chain at the cytochrome C oxidase level. This inhibition in cytochrome C oxidase may play a role in the development of the symptoms observed in acute carbon monoxide poisoning and in some diseases related to smoking. However, the actual mechanism for the inhibition of cytochrome C oxidase by carbon monoxide is still under investigation. Hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide share some common features, both of which inhibit cytochrome C oxidase. Mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase is rapidly inhibited by sulfide via a still unknown mechanism. The next poison is antimycin A, which is a potent and hazardous pesticide or fish poison and a secondary metabolite produced by streptomyces bacteria. Antimycin A is a dangerous electron transport chain inhibitor. It inhibits the flow of electrons through complex 3 of the electron transport chain by blocking the passage of electrons from cytochrome B to cytochrome C. Antimycin is widely used in research to study cellular respiration because of its potent ability to block the electron transport chain. Moving on, let's look at a group of poisons that share a similar mechanism of action in disrupting the electron transport chain. Amital, a barbiturate drug, rotenone, a plant product commonly used as an insecticide, and pyrrhicidin A, an antibiotic, all inhibit electron flow from the iron sulfur centers of complex 1 to ubiquinone and therefore block the overall process of oxidative phosphorylation. Because they only block the flow of electrons from complex 1 to ubiquinone, complex 2 is unimpeded. Therefore, no ATP is formed from NADH. However, two ATPs can be formed per mole of FADH2 that enters via complex 2. The next group of toxic agents operates in an entirely different manner. Aurovertin, oligomycin, and venturicidin are poisonous antibiotics that inhibit ATP synthase or complex 5. These antibiotics inhibit the ATP synthase by binding to it and inhibiting specific components of the complex. These compounds are proven to be potent inhibitors of ATP synthesis and thus stopping phosphorylation of ADP and inorganic phosphate completely. On the other hand, NN dicyclohexyl carbodimide, or abbreviated as DCCD, is an organic compound whose primary use is to couple amino acids during artificial peptide synthesis. It is a classical inhibitor of ATP synthase. 
DCCD inhibits ATP synthase by binding to one of the C subunits and causing steric hindrance of the rotation of the FO subunit, thus preventing rotational catalysis and subsequently ATP synthesis. Let's now discuss the phenomenon of dissociating or separating biological oxidation or respiration from the process of phosphorylation. When protons leak back into the matrix without going through the ATP synthase pore, they dissipate the electrochemical gradient or proton motive force across the membrane without generating ATP. This phenomenon is called uncoupling oxidative phosphorylation. It occurs with chemical compounds known as uncouplers, and it occurs physiologically with uncoupling proteins that form proton conductance channels through the membrane. Uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation results in increased oxygen consumption and heat production as electron flow and proton pumping attempt to maintain the electrochemical gradient. As mentioned, certain chemicals or reagents can uncouple oxidation from phosphorylation. These are the chemical uncouplers and they are also known as proton ionophores. The chemical uncouplers are lipid-soluble compounds that rapidly transport protons from the intermembrane side to the matrix side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Because the proton concentration is higher in the intermembrane space than the matrix, uncouplers pick up protons from the intermembrane space. Their lipid solubility enables them to diffuse through the inner mitochondrial membrane while carrying protons and release these protons on the matrix side. The rapid influx of protons dissipates the electrochemical gradient or the proton motive force. Therefore, the mitochondria are enabled to synthesize ATP. Eventually, the mitochondrial integrity and functions are lost. Examples of chemical uncouplers are exemplified by DNP and FCCP. 2,4-dinitrophenol or DNP and carbonyl cyanide p trifluoromethoxyphenylhydrazone or FCCP are weak acids with hydrophobic properties that permit them to diffuse readily across mitochondrial membranes. They carry protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane, thus after entering the matrix in the protonated form, they can release a proton, thus dissipating the proton gradient. Both uncouple phosphorylation and prevents production of ATP in the mitochondria. Valinomycin is a naturally occurring dodecadepsipeptide used in the transport of potassium and as an antibiotic. Valinomycin is obtained from the cells of several streptomyces species. It is classified as an extremely hazardous substance in the United States. It is an ionophore that allows inorganic ions to pass easily through membranes. It functions as a potassium-specific transporter and facilitates the movement of potassium ions through lipid membranes down the electrochemical potential gradient. Valinomycin as an ionophore uncouples electron transfer from oxidative phosphorylation by also dissipating the electrochemical gradient across the mitochondrial membrane. To continue, the last group of agents that interfere with oxidative phosphorylation are the adenine nucleotide translocase inhibitors. Their prime example is atractyloside. Atractyloside is a toxic hydrophilic glycoside formed by a species of thistle found in the Mediterranean region. It disrupts oxidative phosphorylation by specifically inhibiting adenine nucleotide translocase. As we learned before, adenine nucleoside Translocase transports ADP into and ATP out of the mitochondria through the various mitochondrial membranes. Once these exchanges of adenine nucleotides are disrupted, cytosolic ATP cannot be regenerated from ADP, explaining the toxicity of atractyloside. Before we close this segment on ETC inhibitors, let's spend a brief time learning about the brown fat in the context of oxidative phosphorylation. There is a remarkable and instructive exception to the general rule that respiration slows when ATP supply is adequate. 
Most newborn mammals, including humans and hibernating animals, have a type of adipose tissue called brown fat in which fuel oxidation serves not to produce ATP but to generate heat to keep the newborn warm. This specialized adipose tissue is brown because of the presence of large numbers of mitochondria and thus large amounts of cytochromes whose heme groups are strong absorbers of visible light. The major function of brown adipose tissue is non-shivering thermogenesis, whereas the major function of white adipose tissue is the storage of triacylglycerols in white lipid droplets. As mentioned, the brown color arises from the large number of mitochondria that participate. Human infants who have little voluntary control over their environment and may be susceptible to hypothermia in the immediate postnatal period are protected from the cold by this brown fat. Hibernating animals also depend on uncoupled mitochondria of brown fat to generate heat during their long dormancy. The mitochondria of brown fat are like those of other mammalian cells in all respects except that they have a unique protein in their inner membrane. Thermogenin, also called the uncoupling protein, provides a path for protons to return to the matrix without passing through the ATP synthase complex. As a result of this short-circuiting of protons, the energy of oxidation is not conserved by ATP formation but is dissipated as heat, which contributes to maintaining the body temperature of the newborns and hibernating animals. And finally, mitochondrial diseases are long-term, genetic, often inherited disorders that occur when mitochondria fail to produce enough energy for the body to function properly. Mitochondrial diseases can affect almost any part of the body, including the cells of the brain, nerves, muscles, kidneys, heart, liver, eyes, ears, or pancreas. I have just introduced the reality that indeed mitochondrial diseases exist, but we will not discuss this here anymore. You will hopefully meet them along the course of your journey in medical school. So this ends the lecture in bioenergetics and biological oxidation. These are quite lengthy, complex, and challenging topics, and I hope and pray that this discussion helped in a way for all of us to not only understand but appreciate these concepts as well. Thank you very much for listening, and again, stay safe always.